No, I'm just fine. That's all right. Uh, so, hello, I'm, I'm Josh. I'm a, a PhD student from the University of York. Uh, at York, I'm part of the, the Cyber Security and Privacy Research Group. Um, and some of you may have seen uh, our panelists here today, and you might have even had a conversation with uh, a couple of them. Uh, we also have Stephen joining us online, and he'll appear on one of the screens in a, a few minutes' time. Um, so, hopefully, there's been a bit of a crucial discussion on the intersection of rights, privacy, and kind of the role of the network operator and, and people like you. Uh, in kind of shaping the conversation about uh, rights and, and privacy uh, and the landscape of the, the wider internet. So to set a little bit of background, uh, let's consider the, a little bit of the, the kind of internet's global nature. So it's undeniably changed our, wor our world in a, a number of different ways, driving innovation, enabling communication across continents and geopolitical borders, uh, and providing access to, to knowledge and services at scale. But this also raises a number of complex challenges especially in the domains of privacy and security and what governments are able to do, especially around regulation uh, and keeping people safe in a system where it doesn't really have inherent borders. And where it does have borders, it doesn't follow those domestic boundaries that they might be used to in other kind of contexts and environments. So the, the network operator has quite an important role uh, and as part of a distributed system reliant on peering, network operators are almost fundamental to the backbone of the internet or maybe they are fundamental to the backbone of the internet and ensuring its reliably, uh, reliability and scale, uh, as well as the routing and whether or not we have a neutrality of traffic. So with rights and privacy, and we'll delve, I'll delve into this further in a moment, another consideration is whether there is a right to privacy. Uh, in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, arguably doesn't define it as a right to privacy. Instead, it says no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy. And in UK legislation, our kind of interpretation is everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. So what do we mean by arbitrary? And that's another thing that hopefully we'll have the, the chance to discuss. And how do network operators balance the ethical responsibility to protect vulnerable users? Another consideration in this kind of area is the role of standards bodies and kind of communities within the, the internet space. And by extension, you as network operators being the deciding mechanism by which we decide what the correct balance is between privacy of users and the security of the internet and protecting the vulnerable. Is there a role for governments in this conversation? We might also consider whether there's enough engagement between network operators and governments and standards bodies and whether we can make progress uh, in the interests of all parties in that kind of area. And finally, it's important to consider the role of network operators in actually enacting any sort of policies and legislation and requirements and how we face challenges and kind of regulatory differences around the world and even within the space of the UK. Uh, an example of when I was talking to a colleague the other day was the, the V-chip technology in the US where they installed this kind of technology on all the televisions in the country with the expectation that people like parents could set a pin on their TV and see whether or not the, the content could be displayed on sort of mature levels or whatever to people of different audiences so that parents could protect their children from watching content that was deemed explicit. But when it came to the US, uh, one of the first things you might learn as a child was how to remove the setting on the TV <laughs> so that you could watch it anyway. Uh, so where the kind of enacting legislation and the ability to get around it are two very different conversations. Um, also, I think notably in recent times, we've had the, the passing of the online safety bill, which is now going for royal assent. Um, and there's a consultation open on the revised Investigatory Powers Act that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. So in this panel, we want to share different perspectives on the user's right to privacy and security within the context of the network operator. We hope to consider the technical aspects of this to some extent and also the more moral and ethical and wider discussion aspects of it. And alternative work such as TLS-ECH, which I know Stephen's been quite heavily involved with, uh, and technologies like BGP sex are securing sort of internet routing more widely and whether the adoption of these things is happening the rate we'd like. And also kind of the role of regulation, internet standards and what the network operator's position is in this space. Uh, so that's kind of a bit of an overview of what I hope uh, we'll discuss. I hope it's going to be an open dialogue. Um, please have respect for all the different viewpoints, which I think kind of goes without saying. Um, I'm sure within this room there'll be enough space for quite a bit of disagreement, uh, but that doesn't mean that anyone's wrong, it just means we have differences of opinion. So to kind of start off and embark on this discussion, uh, I'll ask each of our panellists to kind of introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do, uh, that kind of positions, uh, and their initial thoughts on this kind of debate and discussion. Uh, and maybe we should start with Stephen. Hi, uh, 
Good afternoon. I hope my audio is okay. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, uh, sorry, first of all, sorry not to be there. Uh, I, I was looking forward to being there, but unfortunately, the timetable and students having to get lectures interfered with that. Uh, so, I work in Trinity College Dublin in the computer science department. Uh, I've been active with the ITF for a few years. Uh, previously, I was a security area director there. I'm uh, currently on Mopac, but I guess working on, as uh, we said, an implementation of the crypto client over the last. So I guess just to start, a couple of talk to start with, uh, I, I start from the point of view that we should really care kind of most about uh, maybe 99.9 percent .9 of people who use the internet, and who are not bad actors. Uh, I think I think all other interests, from my perspective, uh, seem to be somewhat lower priority, but you know, they still have uh, some priority. And when we're thinking about that, I think in terms of network protocols, um, one thing to note, I think, is that you know, transmitted clear text is essentially always grabbed by somebody and used for some unexpected purpose eventually. Um, perhaps not, a, a, not, all, you know, not initially, but eventually it always kind of happens. So I think we, you know, we should continue to encrypt you know, as much as possible and more widely as possible. Um, and I think that's generally a good thing, a desirable thing to do for, for technical and some other reasons. Now, mind you, that, you know, that does create issues for people. So, for example, like network operators, if they've been used to operating on something that was previously transmitted in clear text uh, for logging or for some security purpose, and now that's equipment, that makes a change for them. Um, but I think that you know, people adjust to those things, you know, and that's okay. It might take a while, it might take a good effort, but overall, I think that's okay. There are, of course, other people who like to surveil at uh, governments to some extent, uh, and essentially, Previously, have been found to be kind of grabbing all the data all the time if they can, um, and also some of those uh, governments uh, have also been found to be attempting to disrupt standardisation of better security schemes over the years. Whilst at the same time, other parts of those same governments are trying to uh, do what I would think is the right thing and improve the privacy and security of, of average users. Um, and I think the last thing that I'd say is I think in the last decade or so, a lot of the emphasis on who's kind of snooping most. I think has moved from governments to commercial entities who are mostly grabbing data before or after encryption, so at, at the endpoints one way or another. And I think I think there certainly is a role for governments uh, to regulate uh, that kind of activity. Um, so we have in the EU we have things like GDPR and new kind of various acts. In the UK has the same kind of thing. Um, again, putting the interests I think of the you know, the 99.9 percent .9 of people who are not bad actors. That seems to me like a good thing. And then lastly, I'd, I'd say, um, we talked about rights earlier. I, I, mean, I think the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights doesn't have any absolute right to anything. They're always contingent and conditional to some extent. Um, and that's true here for security and privacy as well. So, thanks. And again, sorry not to be there. I uh, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, next up, I'll ask Poonam to introduce herself. Poonam is also my supervisor at the University of York. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am Poonam. I am lecturer and assistant professor in computer science department at the University of York. Well, I do research on computer architecture, uh, computer internet, <coughs> IoT, and look the internet from a different perspective. For example, interoperability of the end-to-end -end ecosystem of the internet. And where I look particularly on a privacy and security, what is the interoperability issue from a technical point of view that you know you cannot achieve um, security and to end security, what breaks in between the different protocols, you cannot connect them together. So that's kind of a research I do. And now Josh is working on a little bit more uh, uh, looking internet from a defragmentation issues, different ge geographical influences or politics influences on the internet so that's what where my interest is going on forward so this topic I think uh, if I talk about rights privacies and rest of the thing uh, uh, in in internet context uh, I feel it's it's a very challenging topic and it's very challenging from a couple of points it's no, one, because I work on a technical field, so I can feel that it's very challenging to, even though if I have regulations, even uh, even if I have everything, uh, we, we say, okay, we will, as a user, we will provide you rights to your privacy. How do I make them, you know, underneath 
from a computing point of view that we can deliver and meet their requirements. So there are certain technical challenges we, we are facing when we talk about end-to-end -end system, uh, whereas there are lots of political and geographical, there are other concerns where I, I'm really keen to hear a little bit more from the audience on this point than putting my own views on this one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up we also have Olivia. Olivia has uh, kindly come quite last minute to join us, so I'm very thankful for that. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Olivier Clapin-Ablon. I'm the uh, chair of the UK chapter of the Internet Society. And uh, we do have some experts in, the, in our chapter about this topic, but they, they couldn't make it in person. So I've kind of stepped in and I hope to be able to explain uh, the, the views that we've uh, held for quite some time. Um, the, um, the angle that the Internet Society UK chapter and the global uh, organization hold is uh, primarily through uh, the use of encryption, which it finds as being uh, a key component of how the internet works. Encryption is used for transactions, it's used in email, it's used in uh, uh, internet messaging, in all sorts of ways, uh, and it provides uh, the three levels, three essential levels of, um, of functionalities uh, for the internet to work. One is the actual uh, security of the information that is being transmitted, um, that we all know encrypting the thing cannot be uh, um, cannot be listened to from, from an external uh, party. Uh, the second one is providing the integrity of the communication so that the information that comes in comes out without being tampered at the other end. And we all know that it's important as well. Uh, and the third one is uh, the authentication uh, so that you know who is sending the information and who's receiving the information. That's really the, the three basic things that encryption does. I'm sure there's further uh, uh, discussions we can have on that, but um, we believe that the, uh, the encryption uh, uh, protocols need to be kept as strong as they can, especially with today's world where computers are getting uh, faster and faster and uh, processing is, uh, is uh, able to break more and more things by, um, by brute force attack. Now given this, um, our concern was with regards to the online safety bill. Uh, we actually have followed this since the times when it was called the online harms bill. And uh, back then, there was already some discussion about weakening encryption, whatever that, that meant in some way. Um, as part of the Global Encryption Coalition, uh, we uh, spoke with the partners and, and, well, it came down to the point that it was a very bad idea, uh, having a backdoor, having, and I think we, we would all agree that uh, it's, uh, it, it gives an immediate idea of, well, okay, hackers have one single point of failure that then they can go for. So um, uh, thankfully, we're not seeing any idea about backdoors, or hopefully uh, uh, these days, uh, the, the idea of the concept of a backdoor has been put aside. But what we're seeing is this uh, concept that you can actually do filtering at the edge. Um, so rather than checking things on the network level, uh, you install something on the end user's device. And that again is not a good idea uh, for several reasons. One of them is that it actually breaks the authentication side because what you're including is something in between the end user and the network. And that actually allows for tampering of the data, et cetera, by, by third parties. So that's a, a basic problem that we're, we're seeing here. The other problem that we're seeing with the online safety bill is that it seems to be introduced as a universal panacea uh, of, uh, hey, now, we are able to fight child sexual abuse material, we're able to fight uh, malicious use of the network, etc. And that's a false sense of safety. Uh, relying on a tool uh, that uh, could be bypassed by various ways. And that is, we have to remember the internet is international, is global. Um, that is arguably, uh, well, we don't even know how things will be implemented. Do people coming to this country have to uh, um, add some software to their devices to, um, or is that going to be something that will be pushed out globally? A lot of unknown unknowns and uh, for us it's a real concern uh, because it completely changes on a societal level the way that we police uh, the UK. Um, traditionally democracies police uh, their uh, uh, well, push laws etc through the legal system the police, the legal system, there's a judge involved, etc. What we're seeing here is this concept that we can actually use a Hoover to listen up to absolutely every single communication out there and then uh, see what we do with it. And that is not the sort of thing you have in democracies. You might find that in uh, some countries around the world. Uh, it might be acceptable, but in the UK we're, we're looking at something very different. And really, I guess, on a conceptual level and societal level, we have to think 
do we want to go down that path? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, Rob Wilson. Uh, hello. So um, I've worked with Cisco Systems for about 23 years now in um, service provider networks and, and basically uh, as a software engineer. But on top of that, for the last three and a half years, I've been an area director responsible for network management in the ITF leadership. Um, so I don't have any direct responsibility for security or encryption or anything like that at all. But I do have an interest in terms of the impact of managing networks and from that perspective. I do also have a concern in terms of um, being a parent of two teenage children and how the internet affects them and how they interact with the internet. And although I see uh, many cases where I think it works well and enables good things, I also see problems with how the internet is being deployed and used today that's causing societal problems. And I think some of that comes down to this the fact that we're, going, we're encrypting everything and having more privacy and anonymity on the internet. And some of these issues, I think, are happening at applications higher than the ITF cares about. But I think it's important for me is to try and balance the, the need of everyone's use of the network. So I feel it's important to say, actually, we want, we want to prioritize these particular people and say, privacy is absolute, but maybe we need to have some level of weakening, some level of privacy to, ha to allow some level of filtering at, at various points of the network. So I sort of have a different point of view from that perspective. And that's fine. And I understand the various arguments uh, either way around. It's worth me saying I'm speaking here as an individual and not on behalf of the IETF or the IESG, because my views don't, I think, fit into the IETF consensus. I think I'm, I'm an outlier. Not the only one there, um, but there are, I'm definitely in the minority in terms of that group. But hopefully a, a counterpoint of balance to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, so I've got a, a kind of a bit of a, a structure to this. So hopefully we'll start off by asking, I'll get to ask a few questions and we'll kind of look back at the past, kind of uh, understand what's going on now, and then hopefully we'll have a, a chance for you to all ask questions in a, a few minutes' time. So uh, I guess my first question is kind of reflecting back on, on what we've learned in the last sort of uh, historically uh, and in the last 10 years. Uh, I know Stephen wrote a, a recent thing on 10 years post Snowden. Uh, but what lessons can we learn about the role of the government and network operators in internet standards and particularly around privacy and security? I don't know if anyone wants to give that first or... I'll have a go. Yeah. So, so I think one of the things that... And one of the reasons I'm here, so one of the things I've experienced is that I've seen that the UK government um, in particular is trying to have more of a conversation in the ITF. So they see that the conversation about where the encryption is being de de developed and the, and the policy that goes with that is happening with the ITF. And hence the people um, in the room who use the sort of rough consensus model that ITF does are making those decisions. And they're finding it that, that they would like to have ways of having these discussions within the ITF of how, how in their mind they want to have this sort of loosened level of some level of, of monitoring or filtering coming in. How do you have that conversation? And they find it quite hard to come into the ITF and have that conversation. I think that there's such an entrenched position of the people who believe encryption is either on or off, and this is our view, that it's, they find it very hard, I think, to find that middle ground. And I don't know how we, as a science society, try and find uh, a good space to have a conversation in a way that's not argumentative and aggressive, but people understand that everyone's got their, their goals and needs and trying to find that balance. Uh, my, my view on this is, um uh, having been on the net since what late 80s, so it's changed a lot since then. Throughout the 90s, the governments absolutely had no idea about what the internet was about. In fact, many ISPs didn't have any idea. Well, they weren't even ISPs; they were just telcos back then. But the government definitely came very late into the into the story, and this is how you saw this permissionless innovation taking place, which today, for some, equates to the wild wild west. And I'm. I'm not sure I agree with the idea that it's the World Wide West, but uh, there have been, of course, some cases where, especially in the treatment of personal data by commercial organizations, things have gone probably too far in some cases, but uh, this is the, the price to pay for having free services that, that we see. That being said, the, in, the, the, the government has really wisened up in, in recent years. I'd say in at least the, the past 10 years, things have, have advanced. The concern I have today is there appears to be pressure from pressure groups and rightly so, because some things are still not working well. And of course, the internet brings its share of good things and its share of bad things. But there are some groups that are pressurizing the government to say something has to be done. And this is the problem, this whole concept of thinking, we have to do something, whatever it is. We don't know what it is, but let's do something about it. And I have a concern about this, because the pressure then 
um, is that of, especially for politicians, jumping on the first opportunity that comes and thinks, oh yeah, let's do that, and I'll get a few more points and I'll get re-elected afterwards, rather than looking at the various options that are there and going into something that will be first um, analyzed and have an impact uh, scenario, both commercial impact but also technological impact, and go into something that will um, actually perhaps resolve the problem or, or go towards a, uh, uh, easing the problem whilst at the same time having less impact on the commercial side and on, um, on the societal side. Thank you. I wonder if we get uh, Stephen next. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to agree and disagree with Ralph. Uh, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm sad not to be there is I hope, I hope to be there in presence to disagree with Ralph. Uh, I, I think it is true that the, the consensus in the IETF has very strongly been that we should add better uh, security and privacy to network protocols whenever we can. I think that's been a pretty reasonable consensus for a long time, and I think that's great. I guess where I disagree with Rob is that I, I, this concept of you know weakening or just a bit of filtering, it, it's really hard to see what does that actually mean because when you when somebody presents say here's how I want to do that, it turns out to have lots of bad side effects. I think that's a big challenge. This tension, I don't think, is, you know, it's got, it, you've had this tension for 30 years back to the clipper chip days, if you like, and you can go back earlier to that. I don't think this tension is going to go away. But again, I think it, it's a valid perspective to think about the, the vast, vast majority of people using it that are not back. And, and you know, suggesting some of them, you know, it's a little bit arm wavy that kind of uh, would damage the security and privacy of those people, I think. Seems to me a, a huge cost that's really not worth bearing for, for, for what may or may not turn into the event. Thank you. And I'm putting. So uh, I see this, uh, this point from standards and uh, more of from a standard perspective is that in the internet, <coughs> This whole uh, internet ecosystem is evolving with the time. So that's where, you know, we, even the government, even the technology, even the vendors, even every, everyone in this whole ecosystem, things are moving at a, at a certain pace. And now with the evolving that everyone in the households have a mobile phones, everyone has the access of these internet uh, devices, the control which we would like to bring it the way we were not perceiving it 10 years ago so now the, the from from a technology point of view i'm i'm trying to understand that how we could evolve the system in that the same speed with which the rest of the ecosystem you know the the proliferation of the different iot ecosystem different mobile computer systems and so on so this diversity is too much and could we bring on board all those things and build a standards which can comply with all the ecosystem in the same speed which we haven't perceived in the previous years? So that's again, I, I'm bringing more of like a technological challenges here, how we can address those kind of a challenges which we haven't seen it. The way we government or standard bodies proceed, this, we have a slow space the technology and the use of the technology and uh, the way we are using new use cases are coming up more faster. So there's a gap, there's a, there's a mismatch, and that's what we need to address, how we can address that in a potential near future. Thank you. Uh, I guess kind of moving uh, to a bit more of a loaded question, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll soften the blow a little bit, but like should uh, internet users have an unconditional right to privacy and who or what should be making that decision? Is that the kind of uh, role for governments or is that a, a discussion that network operators should be having within themselves? Uh, I don't know, who wants to go first? Do you want to go, try that, Stephen? Sure, um, uh, apologies that the audio is bad, hopefully it's better. Uh, so I don't think there are any unconditional rights generally, uh, regardless of the internet. Um, you know, in, in talking to human rights workers, they always think there's a balance of rights, uh, and it's often the case that you know, if you try and vindicate the rights of some some set of people, you may um, impose some costs on other people. So I don't think unconditional is, 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 is a good thing to uh, include in the discussion, really, because it's, it's, it's kind of counterfactual. Um, in terms of what governments and, and network operators should do, I think you know, I, I wouldn't. I think network operators are probably in, in, in 
somewhat in a, in a useful position these days because they can see less of the traffic because they've encrypted so much. I think that should help them. Um, in terms of governments, yes, I believe that governments should be regulating commercial entities of all kinds, whether operators or service providers, at, at the application there, and, and trying to force them to do better in terms of, for example, just not collecting data, not storing data. It's less to do with how we, whether we encrypt it in transit or not. I think that's the problem that we're hoping to improve on, never being perfect, but improving. I think a lot of the challenges are with the, the, the data either being collected in the first place or being stored. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if Rob, you have a... So, uh, so I, agree with, I think I agree with Stephen in terms of I don't think that people should have an absolute right to privacy. So I, I think all these things that, um, that so there's a level on a, on a field of where you go on a line, and I think the privacy is very high towards that end. But I think, for me personally, allowing some weakening of that privacy to allow other services filtering to occur or exceptions and things, I, th I see that as potentially a good thing. But I do appreciate that it's really hard to find. that there's a, The technolo technological challenge saying this doesn't exist. There's no point from one end to the other. I do appreciate that. But an example I would have is I know one of my daughters uses um, Discord, I think, for communicating with her friends and things like that. And I pointed out to her that doesn't have end-to-end -end encryption and that there's a potentially a moderator who can, can monitor her conversations. And I was chatting to her about it and she said, well, that's fine because it's actually quite a useful thing for her as a teenager that if there's an inappropriate conversation that she can go and flag that conversation and say, you know, I want somebody to check this. And she said, the two things that matter to me is that you as a parent can't monitor my communications and my peers at school can't monitor them. So, and I agree with that. That's like a good balance of privacy. I, don't, I want to give her her privacy. I don't want to intrude on that. But having some level of filtering ability to know that she's sort of, in some sense, is safe is good. And I do, I, I do think there's a level of education of teenagers and trying to keep them safe online. But the reality of it is that that's really hard. You can't just solve it that way. Yeah, there, there's no such thing as actually an absolute right to privacy. Uh, there's never been. Uh, I'm up to now, before the internet, uh, when someone suspe was suspected of criminal activities and so on, there used to be uh, a judge involved, a, a court, uh, the police, uh, and, and then surveillance taking place. So that's, that's not, not a right to privacy as such. Um, what, what I'm concerned about is that today we're making this as a, a yes or no thing. Do we have an absolute right to privacy or do we not? If we don't, then it's the green light for mass surveillance. If we do, then, uh, then well, then we can't do anything about it. Um, that, that's the, the problem that we have at the moment. I don't think it's a yes or no answer here. I think that just like there was a process in the past uh, by which you could put someone under surveillance, there should be the same kind of process with uh, safeguards, etc. Uh, that democracies afford, those safeguards that make sure that justice is independent of the state or, or independent of, of politics and that you can't misuse those powers that, that you have to be able to put on, uh, someone under surveillance. We don't have that with the proposals that are on, on the table there. What we have, uh, as I've said, is this whole system of, well, everyone uh, is going to have a device by which you can actually listen to them. And uh, there's no real process by which this will happen, and this could be misused in the future. It, it does also, on top of that, have the, the, the problem that if the network operator or the service provider does not actually provide full access and, and doesn't go that extra step, there is a, a massive chilling effect by the level, I don't know whether we'll speak about that later, but the level of um, uh, penalties imposed on companies, which can bring companies out of business altogether. Um, what if they make a mistake? What if they, I mean, it's, it, it really is something that needs to be thought about again. Uh, I totally agree with the Oliver's comment on this uh, issue that it's, it's not possible to have a very black and white rules on these kind of issues. And so where the government or a standard bodies, where they will come and play the, a role in defining what will be that rule. And the question is now everybody has to come on board to decide that because if we are, as you said, uh, Oliver said just now, that it's if an operator will come and they will, are not following that standard or you know regulation, they are liable for you know penalties and things. The same happens with. So maybe we, we it's, it's I think everybody has to come together and think about what will be that, where we where's the gray area between black and white and where we have to draw a line in between. And I think that requires it 
quite a lot of debate. I don't know. It's it it will in, it should include all the operators definitely, but it also include the government policies and maybe. Um, I'm not sure how we will take into general public opinions on that side of things. So it's quite complex. I'm I'm happy to hear anyone has from the audience has any any view on this one. Uh, I'll ask one final question. But if you have any interest in asking this panel uh, any questions, if you want to make your way towards the mic, uh, it'd be really useful. So I can kind of balance time in that respect. Um, but my my next question will be. Uh, Kind of now looking at what's happening now, what is the, the role of internet standards in guiding policy, uh, legislative uh, and regulatory discussions, both in the UK and, uh, and there's similar legislation that's recently been uh, introduced in the EU and is being enacted over the course of the next year? Uh, and does this uh, or could this happen the other way around? Should uh, network operators be working in this space to enhance user privacy or is this kind of a discussion that they shouldn't be involved in? I don't know if anyone wants to go for that first. I, I, can, I can say a few words. I, I think that network operators should, should uh, by the very knowledge that they have about how the network operates, uh, act as real teachers and, and ed have an educational value towards those people making these decisions. Unfortunately, we've seen the debates in Parliament and the debates taking place uh, out there as being filled with emotion and very few facts, actually. Uh, and, and unfortunately, then we end up with this sterile debate and things uh, going to Parliament. And instead of actually going for some balanced output, ending up with something which is probably unworkable, uh, technologically speaking, uh, which is pretty terrible um, uh, lawmaking. Because if, if you're going to, to draft a bill, uh, it's probably better to be able to implement it afterwards. So definitely a, a, a lot of educational uh, um, help on this is required and uh, perhaps some, some looking again at uh, what has been passed and seeing how you can find a middle of the road solution that will involve safeguards, that will uphold the privacy of, of uh, law abiding citizens whilst at the same time helping out with those, uh, those people that are using the, the internet for, for malevolent use. I, um, so I would say, uh, if you if you look in in the history of the way all the standards have been developed in last 20, 30 years, it's not not um, that okay. This is the standard we decided in a single day. It's or a one set of communities not deciding. It. It's most most of the time the standards are evolved over time, and and lots of community which. Uh, are part of that standard, those who will be affected by those standards are the um, audiences or uh, contributors on making those standards. So it's, I think it's the same thing applies here as Oliver said, it's operators have to give an input, whereas also the users have to give an input on this one, like end users. And this, this whole ecosystem is quite long. It's not a, like we are just not talking about operators, they are service vendors, they are, they are uh, service providers in between, end users. This the whole ecosystem has so many entities involved in this, how they, are, they will be impacted and what will be the impact of the standards which is coming into the, uh, in, in force. So um, it's an it's a evolving process, I would say. It's not, okay, okay, this is not a timeline. Oh, if we can define, let's build a standard tomorrow. It's not going to happen this way. It, it is a, let's put one, something, a draft forward. Let's see how people react to this. And it will be an iterative process. And we will say, yes, we, we have a timeline, maybe next five years or next three years, whatever it is. But we will go from there. So um, I wish I had a pad of paper. It's so, so helpful, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> so effectively, I think the way I see it at the moment is the IETF has this view of uh, rough consensus, and the people in the room are making decisions, and they're talking, they have their set position, and they and they start at one point, and then you have the government organisations, they have their, their requirements and set position, and they're sort of another side, and they're both like throwing grenades at each other effectively, or I don't know, maybe it's a bit harsh, but they, they find it really hard to have that conversation in the middle, and somehow I don't think I 
either of those end up in really good solutions. I think that either of those are nice in one perspective, but they don't actually solve enough of the problems. And it's finding that middle ground. Now, where do network operators come into that? So if, if we ever move to a, to a system where there is any sort of monitoring or filtering and things like that, I think it's absolutely critical that the users can trust that, that filtering that's occurring. So you need to decouple the filtering that's happening so it's not being done directly by the governments. It's being done by third party companies that are being outsourced that you as a user can choose who's doing that and can have trust in them. You need to have the ability to have logging of what they, how much how much data is being filtered, monitored, etc. And, and, and getting that out. So I think from a perspective, from a network operator's perspective, being able to monitor and see what's going on from that aspect and being keeping everyone open and honest, that I think is critical at that level or whatever whatever part of the network that does this I think is, is, is key to see that. And if you push it on to the end hosts, I sort of see that as being worse because you have less visibility into it, probably. Stephen, what are your thoughts? Uh, so to just comment on Rob last, I, I, I think I completely disagree. I think network operators are in a much better position if they can see what, what is happening at the application layer, as opposed to trying to inject them into the application layer um, for all sorts of reasons. But I think for the network operators, I would imagine that they should see that as a, as a, as a danger and not as a benefit. Uh, you know, to, to the point about whether filtering and logging is happening, it's happening uh, to a huge level. I don't think we've been more kind of tracked uh, on the internet as, as we are currently, and it's hopefully governments will help to regulate some of the large entities doing that and, and reduce it. Uh, on, the, on the point of you know how to kind of get good internet standards, I think one of the one of the positive thing about internet standards over the last few decades has been that they tend to be based in reality. And a problem that would arise if you try to have like a more representative approach of, of whether that's for end users or for governments injecting requirements, that would, that very easily would could transition into something that's impractical. Uh, I think we've seen that in other standards organizations over the years, if we, if we kind of go back to different models like that. Also, you know, a part here is I think a lot of people talk about it, assume that, that a government that is more or less or I find acceptable when they think about this. We also have to think that there's lots of governments in the world. And for anyone, and I'm sure there's a bunch of them, you don't think it's desirable for them to be controlling how we develop and manage their standards. So I think there's a, there's a bunch of tensions that there. There's not a perfect situation. Uh, and lastly, I would totally agree that things take a while. Things take way too long um, in order to get standards developed. But I think that's just the nature of being over. Thank you. Um, at this point, I, I want to ask if anyone else has any questions at all they'd like to ask our panel. Hey, thanks. That was really interesting what you said so far. I, mean, I have several questions. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a rabbit hole they are. I may have to wait for a discussion <laughs> later on. Um, but let's try one or two of them. So, um, first question was earlier on. So you were discussing about um, moving this. We've got this process of basically hoovering up data, and there are different ways it can be done at different points in the communication chain and so on. I really question why we're we doing this, um, and why is why is any work being put into this at all? Why is anyone even bothering to do this? To create technology or standards that help to help us to Hoover up data. Um, why? Okay, sounds like a strange question. So perhaps I can explain that a bit more. Um, we are told that, um, for example, this mass hoovering of data will help to catch criminals. Um, for example, pretty pretty common use case. Um, but what we also know is that there is so much data that needs to be hoovered up. It then has to be severely filtered because it's just an enormous amount of data. Thus, if you filter the data, um, you miss something. So you reduce the effect of, I mean, you try to filter to what is the most important stuff, but you're always going to miss something. So then comes the question of how effective is the data set you're left with? Uh, and I would guess that that information is not public. Therefore, I ask, what is the justification for the extreme amount of work that is going into this if there is no, or is there information being provided about the effectivity of, of, of this process? Oh. So, so if I was a politician, I would answer you AI. 
<laughs> That's it. It's the answer to everything. It will, it will work. Solved. Um, but I'm not a politician, so I, I agree with you. It's, it's a, a real question. The more data you collect, the more you end up with a needle in a haystack. And, and this is where there is a, another question. You might miss the, the obvious that's, that's right in front of you. One of the problems is that by spending more time on this type of surveillance, you then have less time and less funding for other types of traditional surveillance, which has so far yielded pretty good results. We saw the, uh, I don't know if any of you have looked at the Internet Watch Foundation's figures about how many people they've caught and they've helped catch last year. It's, it goes in the thousands. So there, there, there are some great results already happening today. Um, and of course, uh, you might say, yeah, but there, that means there are thousands of criminals out there. Yes, there are. There are, but there are millions and millions of people using the internet. So we're looking at a very tiny little percentage of internet users that are actually using it in, in a, a, a bad way. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, finding that, doing that, that whole hoovering, if one would call it like this, uh, is, is something that might not read the, well, might not yield the results that we want. And on top of that, there's the whole thing of the false positives. Because yes, you're not gonna get some people reading these things day in, day out. So it's gonna be a machine language, machines that are gonna be doing this, and you're gonna have false positives, and if you don't have any, um, uh, any judicial system involved with safeguards, etc., you're gonna have some people's lives completely wasted um, because of false positives that a machine has suddenly uh, put their fingers on. So does, does this mean that if you're a, a vendor or someone who works in standards development or in regulation or just a network operator, does that mean that we should actually be pushing back and saying, I'm not gonna participate in this effort to contribute to the, to the hoovering until you can show me that it's actually helpful, useful, worthwhile? That's what some of the big operators out there uh, have, uh, have responded so far. Um, the likes of Facebook, uh, the likes of, uh, I think was it Signal? Um, some are saying, oh, uh, we might not be able to take part in this. But it's still unknown because it's, it's one of these things. <laughs> Is there going to be a clash? No one knows. Can I just come back on the... So the IWF, I, my understanding, again, I don't know them very well. I did chat to Dan, who's I think, CTO of there. So my understanding of the IWF is, yes, they're, they're catching a certain number of people today, but their concern is as more and more encryption gets rolled out, that ability to do that filtering and capturing will disappear. So, so, so they're effectively, I don't know, they're capturing HTTP requests rather than HTTPS or what they're doing effectively, but it's, it's, it's what they're doing today gets turned off. And the same thing, the same concern that I think the UK government has regarding uh, Facebook Messenger going to end-to-end uh, -end encryption. That today they effectively can, and again, I don't understand why the people who are misusing the service don't use WhatsApp instead, but effectively people are daft and do that. But there's a certain number of people that they're capturing today and that just gets turned off because the end-to-end -end encryption says you can't do any of this. So I think that's the concern is, is not that um, everyone's got all this encryption everywhere today and um, and it's working, it's, it's as this encryption gets rolled out, as the encrypted um, DNS gets rolled out and things like that, they, then it's turning off all these existing streams and filtering that they're doing. And whether that filtering is right or wrong is, is a different argument. But, but I think the technology is moving along, the, the, I think that they've been caught up behind the curve, I mean, everything moves slowly. And I think that they're now saying, wait a minute, this is gonna be a real problem and hence we need to try and fix this. And it's how do you have that conversation and where do you fix it? To go back to like the hoovering up lots of information, I, I, don't, I haven't read the online safety bill. I don't want to. I've, I've looked at it, but it's, it's way too long. And I'm not trying to justify their approach and saying this is the right answer. My concern comes back to the, the not having a useful conversation with the people who understand the technology and say this is what can be done. And the policy people saying this is what we need to do and, and trying to find that middle ground. So instead, you end up with a policy definition that is, is not where we want to be. So by not having that conversation, I think we've ended up in a worse place. And so my hope is they try and do something with the online safety bill, they figure out, and I think Ofcom said they're gonna be pragmatic with it, whatever that means. They try and figure out what bits work, what bits don't work, and then revise that and evolve that into some, to a better solution. Whether that happens, no idea. I, I can see Stephen is uh, itching in his seat, trying to wait for a chance yeah, to respond yeah. to that, so I'll give you that chance now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so a couple of points. I guess to, to it, the introduction of more widespread encryption, every time that happens, a number of people in the sky will fall. 
and the sky hadn't fallen. I remember, for example, when YouTube turned on HTTPS, a number of network operators screaming and one banging a table at a meeting of that um, on the basis that they couldn't deal with the kind of radio the radio allocation fairly because of this encryption. And it turns out they could. So I, I think a lot of these kind of the sky will fall arguments don't really hold up uh, if we look back at them. Uh, I think more interesting than a questioner is asking about different types of kind of data graphers. And I, I think there's really three different kinds, and it's useful to distinguish them in, in terms of thinking about how, we, how and what one might do and with whom one, one might have a discussion. So I think there's, there's the you know, signals intelligence agencies. They're going to just keep doing it. They will never be open about it. They will disregard any laws that, that say you should protect privacy. They will just do what they want to do, because that's, that's what they think they're all. Then there's commercial entities, which are, uh, the likes of Facebooks of uh, the world, which are grabbing way back to data, in my opinion. And hopefully governments will stop down on that by regulation and, 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 uh, and various laws, etc. And then there's the law enforcement thing, which is kind of not spooked, not the signals intelligence agencies, but law enforcement. And that there, I think the problem is that for law enforcement to have that discussion would likely result in them having less capability than they currently have in many cases. So they're unwilling to have the discussion. I, I think if they, you know, if they if they do turn up to the various a technical forum, people are willing to discuss with them. But I think it's a problem on their side is that, you know, if they have a conversation about being able to, to, to grab some kind of data, it immediately raises the question of, let's say I have a pacemaker installed in somebody, somebody's body and it's communicating with a phone, how is that protocol going to be immune to the law enforcement, whereas an instant message is somehow not immune? I, I don't think there is an answer. And I think that's a challenge because it means law enforcement are unwilling to turn. They know part of their argument is essentially a losing argument. So my question, uh, I would just like to add in this one that, you know, the encryption thing which we are doing from end-to-end -end encryption, it is not working until we have a proper authentication at the start. So for example, I am one of the users, say, on Facebook. Uh, if I'm allowing my, uh, if I'm allowing my um, say my privacy is very important and I say, okay, I'm going for this feature where uh, my data should be encrypted. Before I get that facility to encrypt my data end to end, I should be validated and authenticated, you know. There will be some valid means that I'm a real person. I have identity checks and everything done so that there are bad uh, um, actors in the network which will be filtered out before they use that kind of a feature. So that kind of a system has to be in a place before we move into a, then I can say, okay, I am a good person. It's, I, I deserve my privacy in this ecosystem. So I have to prove that. And then how we make that system a, a proper authentication system. Now that itself is a, itself is an issue. Why Facebook is not able to check every validity of every person who is registering in a Facebook kind of ecosystem because they don't have a proper authentication system. For example, they some sometimes they check like, okay, you are 18 year old. Uh, I have seen teenagers registering themselves saying, oh, I am 18 year old, and they are going and accessing those kind of a platform. So that itself is an issue and we have to think about you know it's it's it has to go hand to hand there are a couple of things needs to be fixed before we go and request oh i have a right to privacy the, the problem is how do you roll this out globally yeah and how do you roll this out in countries that are not democratic because at yeah. that point it's the perfect way to stop people from being able to use those services you're like sorry you can't can't get on it yeah, so that's again bringing into a new other challenges. <laughs> it's it's you know the the internet is not just the UK. It's a yeah. global network of networks, and yeah. I think often people tend to you know lawmakers tend to forget about this, and uh, tend to think oh we'll fix it and we'll have the safest internet in the world. Well, you need the two ends to be the safest in the world. Internet. Otherwise, your side will not be as safe as you know. It's just rubbish. Sorry, but <laughs> thank you. Cool. I I actually have a I actually have a second question, but. Does anyone else want to have an ask question before? No? Right. You just go for it. <laughs> okay. Because as you, you just touched on what my second question relates to. Then we were talking about the absolute right to privacy, and you just mentioned it just now in your, in your response. So, uh, but also you collectively spoke about it earlier, the, the absolute right to privacy. Um, and 
it has not existed up until this point, and so um, it probably doesn't really exist. It certainly doesn't exist probably in any legislation. Um, the question, my, so my question is, um, if we say no, there is no absolute right to privacy um, for some genuine reasons. Uh, so, so I think, for, for example, you gave the good example earlier that this is, it's, it's not so binary, it's, just, it's more of a spectrum. And there should be very good privacy up to a point. Um, but the problem is, where do you put the needle on the, on the, on the spectrum? Um, and wherever you put it, there are going to be some tough issues. So my question is then, um, in theory, we can say, no, there's no absolute right to privacy. But in practicality, we can't implement this very well. So it's much easier to implement binary full privacy or none at all. OK, so because wherever we drop the needle and say, this is a, this is a good amount of guaranteed privacy, where, wherever we drop it, there's going to be some, some issues. So if we can't actually practically implement it, should we, in fact, just go for full privacy? So, so I think that, for me, it's the, the difference between like end-to-end -end encryption or just encryption. So you can encrypt between uh, your, your end clients and a server that's holding the data, even temporarily, and passing it on. And, it's, and it can be decrypted in that middle point, and you can do things to it. So, so uh, like Facebook Messenger might use today, or Slack, I know, does that. And we have. I have communications with people that I afford a level of privacy and assumes a level of privacy, but it's not using the end-to-end -end encryption. So, so I still struggle to see why you have to have end-to-end -end encryption everywhere, that, that actually you can get a pretty reasonable level of privacy or sufficient privacy for that use case. That means you don't have to go the full, full path of saying there's, there's, there's privacy all the way and all the time and everywhere, and that you can find these middle grounds. But I admit that the point that you decrypt in the middle, you have no guarantees. That you can't have any guarantees. You're trusting some third party, party entity to not misuse your data. But in the same way, in that communication, you're trusting every other person who's an endpoint in that. You know, Matt Hancock's um, WhatsApp explosion of stuff like that. That was, that was over end to end encryption, but didn't save the government in terms of what it was because you have to trust the people um, having that data. And, and to Stephen's point, actually, I wish I'd come back to this because he's made a very valid point here is that we've talked. I've focused quite a lot about in terms of government's use of encryption and, and uh, surveillance and monitoring and lots of the thing, but there's a lot of stuff happening in the applications above that. And, and of the harms, again, that I see, I think a lot of those harms are probably being caused by those applications. And the, the legislation, I think, would be good the more we have to sort of control that and monitor that. But again, I don't know how you do that. How you tell a company, you mustn't hold this private data, but how do you actually guarantee that they don't do it? I mean, it's really hard. And if, 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 if it worked in that scenario and you can stop it doing that way, why can't you stop a government from also not misusing their filtering in the same way? If, if, you, if one of those things work, why isn't it working the other way? I wonder if, uh, Stephen, you want to come back on that? Sure. And again, just to the questioner's question, um, I, I really don't think it's useful to talk about absolutes. And what, you know, we have no anonymity. We have, you know, we have no absolute privacy. That's never going to happen. Uh, so for example, even if you're using WhatsApp, Facebook are quite able to counter spam, even though there's end-to-end -end encryption, because they can see who's interacting with whom, when, for how long. There's lots of uh, traffic analysis that can be done. You don't have proof. Um, you know, I, there's myriad examples of that. And, and if you look at the mobile app ecosystem, there's tremendous numbers of examples of these, these app, end endpoint applications that are doing horrible things. But we don't have that privacy. No point in even asking that. We can make it slightly better, at least from a network perspective. Uh, so to Rob's point, I think it, it's. Not, I think as engineers developing network protocols, we need to provide, the, I think, the best mechanisms we can, which, in terms of trying to secure data between two endpoints, means essentially end-to-end -end encryption at a technical level. I'm not talking about at the level of, of uh, you know, of legislation or whatever. Uh, and one of the reasons is that if you don't know who the you don't know, you don't know who the middle boxes are, you can't know who the middle boxes are. Um, once once it's possible for one randomly uh, named middle box with a weird IP fix address that you, makes no sense to the end user, once it can see some of the traffic, lots of others will be able to see the traffic, and that's the, that's a technical challenge. Um, if you contrast that with something like email, where, where we, deployment is much more hot by hot security, 
then yes, you have some interaction with a mail server, and the mail servers have identities that are somehow meaningful to end users. And then you could then it makes a lot more sense that you don't need as much end-to-end -end security for email. Um, but again, having a some random uh, SMTP server be able to hoover up all the emails that go between two large enterprises, let's say, or between uh, random citizens and their healthcare providers. That's just undesirable. It should be trying to engineer the best things to make that as hard as possible. It will never be perfect. We should make interfering with, with the traffic, seeing the end, the end user's data as hard as possible for entities that have no business seeing. Yeah, I would like to add a little bit more on this from a net network operator point of view, because when we are talking about end-to-end -end encryption, it may have other side effects on the network optimization, because many operators does loads of optimization based on the data which is coming in the network, and whether that has an impact back on the functionality of the network itself. So that's, again, a technical point of view. You need to think about it, what has, once we are building this privacy thing, whether that will break the operations, which we are able to now, able to do in the networks. And maybe a, a, for that one, like Quick is a good example. So I think Quick then reduces the ability to do uh, like TCP optimizations you would do if you come off like a satellite connection and things like that because you just can't do it. And, and maybe that's the cost that you pay for, for quick. I, I don't know. Um, but effectively, there are always trade-offs here. And, and I guess with all engineering organizations, you're constantly changing and you might get it wrong and then hopefully you engineer those mistakes out and optimize for, for make a better solution, whatever better is. Yeah, the, 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 uh, on the, the topic of privacy, indeed, there is no um, universal privacy as such. Just, just the metadata of your interactions is already extremely valuable, and that is not encrypted. You know, who is connected to who in Facebook and in, in whatever. All of that information can be found and is known by the operators. Uh, that already is, is old-fashioned policing. Uh, where criminals network with other criminals. So there you go, you can go from one to the other. You don't have to, to suck absolutely everything out there. You can go from, from hop to hop. But there's also the point that in between privacy and no privacy, we have a system that already exists with thousands of judges and lawyers that are paid to determine whether someone's privacy rights should be lifted or not. And this is one thing that we tend to forget, or that I guess governments tend to forget in thinking, well, no, let's put everything, uh, everyone under surveillance. Um, the, the, yes, the system has to uh, be done one person at a time, but this is how the justice system works, and this is how you minimize miscarriages of justice. Uh, if you have a, a different system, you end up with uh, statutory uh, 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 imprisonment, etc. You, you end up with all sorts of, of problems that we don't like to see in our democracies. So this is why I'm, um, uh, I emphasize the fact that uh, if you're going to have to legislate between or, or decide between um, privacy or no privacy for, for an individual, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Great. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your responses. Uh, if no one else has a, another question, I uh, have a, a question that I think would be quite interesting. Uh, so, so in the online safety bill, uh, one of the, the things that the government is introducing as part of this uh, is a 7% of all global earnings penalty on operators that don't take sufficient action to prevent harm to their users. If this was applied to a network context, would that be fair? And should network operators be liable for the content that they carry on their networks, bearing in mind that they have some element of surveillance over the top of it? Do you want to say something? Uh, I go for it. Uh, I would say, how, how many of you, I don't know if, if you know, how many of you drive, and, and how many of you have, by mistake, turned right, and then you find out, oh, no, there's no turning right. Um, you know, mistakes do happen. Uh, we all make mistakes, and it's frightening to see that um, the, the both network operators and uh, content providers are now being uh, put under such a threat of something which could signify a death sentence for them. Um, it's um, it's terrible. Uh, it, it might take some some companies completely out of business for for a process that was not seen and for uh, an improper uh, um, uh, use of their 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 powers. So I I really don't know how how that's going to pan out. 
it, it seems to be extremely harsh, and it seems more of a deterrent, as in do this or else, uh, than uh, a way to, uh, to actually uh, uh, implement this. 7% of a, a company's earnings is, uh, is crazy. It's very, very high indeed. It sets the bar very high. So, so I was going to say, I mean, I think that to me, if, if it gets to the point where they're enforcing that level of, of uh, fine on a company, you'd hope that the company is deliberately maliciously ignoring the rules and things. And the, <laughs> my hope is there's a proportionality and they'll talk to them and try and say, no, you need to change it, that sort of thing. So I guess it's definitely possible that this law could be misused in that sense. Agreed. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, we'll find out. I wonder, Steve, you've been uh, working around uh, TLSCCH and uh, kind of you've described the, the hiding of SNI as one of the, the fixing one of the last privacy leaks in kind of transmission. So I wonder you what your thoughts are. Uh, so on, on, on finding companies, uh, I think a lot of them have too much money. So I'm, I'm not necessarily against that. It's done for a good purpose. But uh, in, in terms of it, yeah, I mean, I think it's a tidy enough thing. It's not a major change. Um, <laughs> It, we, you know, it just basically is that there's, historically we had the server, server name indication mentioned in the TLS handshake, that was visible, people use it for good and for bad, um, but it, you know, it's not necessarily the kind of thing you really want because it's essentially sending clear text that might be vulnerable to being abused by in middle boxes and network observers, and I think it's just a small change to tidy up a, a, a privacy leak that still is there when we'd be better off without it. Uh, in that case, uh, we've come to pretty much the end of our time, so I want to thank all of our panellists for coming along and, and having a conversation with us. Um, so if we could just thank them first. Uh, and thank you, Stephen, for joining us remotely. Uh, I know you wanted to be with us today, but thank you very much for that too. Um, and if anyone has any questions after this, I'm sure some of our panellists will be happy to have a discussion with you. Uh, I know the Internet Society has done quite a lot around the online safety bill, which has quite a lot of ramifications for quite a few people in the room. Uh, by the way, thank you very much. Thank you. Isoctashi.org, the plug. <laughs>